In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment, that I am heartily sorry for them, and seek to do them good, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy, Lord, 
Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we implore you to hear our prayers and to lighten the darkness of our hearts by your gracious visitation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the third Sunday of Advent is from Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will rend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle text is from 1 Corinthians chapter 4. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. I am not aware of anything against myself, but, uh, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is the gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God.
Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Gaudete Sunday, the Sunday of rejoicing. Even in this penitential season of Advent, we see a glimpse of the joy that we expect when our Lord comes back to judge the living and the dead. Today's gospel has caused a bit of debate among Christians. The text states that John the baptizer was talking to Jesus through his disciples and asking this question, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? This is John the Baptist who even as a baby leapt for joy at the sound of Mary's voice, who cried out, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, who declared, behold the Lamb of God, who witnessed, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And how is it that he now asks, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Now, one group of Christians, they just can't believe that John had these doubts, and they suggest that John was concerned that his disciples were too attached to him. John wanted them to be attached to Jesus. So he sent them with this question so that they would attach themselves to the Messiah. John was hoping that their experience with Jesus would convince them that Jesus was indeed the true Messiah, the one who was coming and hoped for by all of God's people. Now, other theologians suggest that John had his doubts just like any other person. After all, John had prophesied a kingdom of grace and judgment. Yet John had declared, behold, the Lamb of God, but he also declared, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He called the delegation from the ruling council, you brood of vipers. Happy Advent, you brood of vipers. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So where is Jesus' axe? Where is the fire? Why doesn't Jesus rescue me from this prison? I see the grace and the mercy, but where is the judgment? Is it possible that this Jesus is not the one who is coming? Now, Christians of good conscience can side on either, either place, either side of the debate, but they cannot deny that John asked the question that they cannot deny also that Jesus, he also answered it. They cannot deny that even the strongest faith has doubts. And while theologians can debate whether John asked this question from doubt, there is no doubt in our minds that he had days when he was, as we might say, bewildered. Everyone does. We know this from the personal experiences that we've had with the attacks of Satan as he tries to undermine our faith and our place before God. And how often do we doubt God because he doesn't remove the arthritis or cure the cancer or the bad the high blood pressure, or take us off the oxygen, or fix our hip, or our finances, or our children, or whatever it is for which Christ has rebuked us not to be anxious. How often do we doubt God because our family is in disarray? Or how often do we doubt God because life is just plain old hard? Doubt is one of those sins it's a sin of thought that will never really go away while we live in a sin-sick world. And even when it's not front and center in our minds, it is always lurking, ready to take advantage of any situation. It is one of those sins that reminds us that just because everybody does it, that doesn't make it right. Even though everyone doubts, it is still a sin. It is still an indication that we have earned for ourselves the fires of hell. And even, in a sense, it is a form of idolatry. And like it, like, and it, like every other sin that plagues us and our lives, it shows that we cannot save ourselves. It shows us that we need a savior. And doubt has plagued mankind for thousands of years. And we can see this throughout the scriptures. 
Now, when God called his creation good, the devil told Eve it could be better. The serpent's words then causing Eve to doubt what the Lord had spoken. And we know the rest of that story. We know Abraham. He had doubts, and we know that whole thing with Hagar, thinking there was no possible way for his old wife to have a child, as God had said. Moses had doubts right in front of the burning bush, even as he was hearing God's voice speak to him. And you read the Psalms of David, and doubts spill out all over the place. The disciples, they all doubted the resurrection until Jesus appeared to them behind the closed doors. So those of us who are honest enough to admit that we have doubts, we know that we join with some pretty famous people in the Bible, people who are considered even heroes of the faith. And instead of thinking too much about John's reason for asking this question, Let's turn our attention rather to Jesus' answer, his assurance that it gives to doubters of every age. Because John didn't get an answer, a direct yes or no answer from Jesus. Instead, he told John's disciples, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. Now, there were many false prophets who claimed to be the Messiah, but only Jesus could let his works do his talking for him. Anytime we see Jesus healing, we see him, see him removing the curse of our sin. He undoes the damage of Eden, the damage that was done there when we fell into sin. And Jesus' works also and maybe even more importantly, show us the fulfillment of the scriptures. You might remember how Isaiah had talked about the time when the Messiah would come when he said, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. And from John's gospel, we might recall how even the blind man in the temple had said, Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And as much as Jesus' healing ministry showed that he is the one, the one who comes, his preaching ministry shows even more that he is the promised one. For the prophet says this about the Messiah, Isaiah chapter 61, that the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. And now here is Jesus preaching good news to the poor. All signs are in place. Everything points to Jesus as the Messiah. And here is the answer that assures John and which assures us today that Jesus is the one who is coming into the world. And after John's disciples take off to take their witness back to John, Jesus turns to the crowd and he talks about this John guy a little bit more. He asks a series of questions that describe John as one who did not lead by taking a vote to figure out what it was that people were going to do and and getting out in front of him and getting it done. He was not one who was out for the riches or the power or the fame or for a nice comfy position in the royal palace. He didn't have to come up with a corny mission initiative or program. Instead, John was God's messenger. He was willing to go to prison and to die for his preaching of the word. And Jesus said this about John, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Now, I'd say those are some pretty strong words of praise, especially when you consider that they are coming from the mouth of God himself. It is then that Jesus proclaimed one of those, I guess you could call it a paradox. I guess these are the kind of things that would keep any number of theologians up at night arguing and 
till he does finally come back to judge this world. Jesus said, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, greater than John the Baptist. Now friends, what does this mean? If no one is greater than John, then how can the least be greater than him? How can the least be greater than the greatest? Jesus himself gives us the answer to that question. Think back to Luke chapter 10 where he said, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. John the Baptist, the baptizer, was the last of the Old Testament prophets. God's words were spilling out of his mouth and he was blessed to see the coming of HaMashiach, the Messiah. But he did not live long enough to see the end of the Messiah's mission on earth. And just as Moses stood on the mountain and he could see the promised land and yet never experience it, so too John saw the future. He saw the kingdom of heaven, but he never experienced it before his death, at least not in its fullness but John joined the great heroes of the faith that we might find in, in Hebrews 11 mentioned, of whom it is said, all these having gained approval through their faith did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us they would not be made perfect. So it is that while none of us will be the prophet that John was, we are all greater than John because we have seen our salvation fulfilled in him who became least of us all on the cross. John declared that Jesus is God's perfect Passover lamb. But we have a full picture of our salvation history that shows us how Jesus became that lamb by becoming a sacrifice. We know that Jesus lived a perfect life before God, a perfect life before neighbor, that he lived righteously according to God's law and commandment. And the good news that is preached to us today is that through his promise and the washing of water and word, through the regeneration and renewal of his Holy Spirit, that in baptism he gives us perfect life. He gives us his perfect life as he takes all of our sin and even the sin of our doubts onto himself. And even through such instruments as Pontius Pilate, he received the punishment, the judgment that we had deserved. And by his death, he conquers all of our sins. And through his resurrection, causes us to believe that he is the path, the only way to eternal life. And so even as we expect his second advent, we experience Christ's baptism of spirit and fire, and we know the intimacy of Jesus' presence with us as we eat and drink his body and blood in the sacrament of this altar for the forgiveness of our sins, which continually preaches to us that we have life. That good news is preached to our dead and dying years even in a world that clings to the unbelief of, that is thrown at us from every angle, clinging to every idol, which our sinful hearts still desire, that by grace God has saved us and given us the good news to believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And John saw all of this as a prophet, but he did not experience it, not in this life but by faith we experience it now. And by faith, as we stand in the kingdom, we have an even greater blessing from God. And Satan often will send doubts to attack us, but how blessed we are that Christ's answer to John also comforts us in our doubts. And we're even more blessed to have a full revelation of Christ's salvation in word, and in mystery and the gift of the sacraments, where Christ continues to dwell in tabernacle among us. 
And through these precious gifts, God removes our doubts and our fears, and he gives us a reason to rejoice, to give thanks, even in the valley, even as he makes us greater than the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Send me a clean heart, O oh God. We stand for prayer.
Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. For the church, that she would rejoice in the glad tidings of her coming Savior and be comforted by the good news of his perfect life and his sacrificial death for her salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our pastors in Christ, that they would regard themselves as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, and that they may be found trustworthy as they carry out their duties. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, that we would forgive as we have been forgiven, give as we have been given to, and love as we have been loved. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our president and all those in high positions of authority among us, that they may be guarded from every evil and kept from using their power for selfish gain, serving always with the common welfare of all in mind. Let us pray to the Lord. For the homeless and the hungry and those who suffer want through unemployment, that they may receive the help that they need, and that we as God's blessed children would always stand ready to assist those in need. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For the sick and the suffering, that the one who gives sight to the blind, heals the lame, cleanses the lepers, gives hearing to the deaf, raises the dead and preaches good news to the poor, may sustain them in their trials with his compassion, and grant them healing in accord with his perfect will. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord For those who come to Zion's feast today, that they would rejoice in the gracious visitation of their Savior at the holy altar, receiving his very body and blood for the forgiveness of their sins and the strengthening of their faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the prophets and all faithful saints who spoke in the name of the Lord before us, let us give thanks and praise to our God and for steadfastness in faith that we might look with hope for the revealing of Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior, on the last day. Let us pray to the Lord. Into your hands, dear Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared proclaiming him the promised Messiah, the very Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and calling sinners to repentance, that they might escape from the wrath to be revealed when he comes again in glory. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, 
evermore praising you and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you, and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.